All right, so I'll, I'll kick us off. Um, so thanks everyone for, for joining. Uh, I'm super excited to have uh, Dr. Bob Gatton be with us today. Um, Bob is the co-director of the Center of Excellence for Evolutionary Therapy and the department chair of diagnostic imaging at the Moffitt Center. He's also a radiologist who specializes in exploring theoretical and experimental models of evolutionary dynamics in cancer and cancer drug resistance. He's developed an adaptive therapy approach for treating cancer, which has shown promise in improving survival times with less cumulative drug use. He's also led the formation of a program called the Integrative Mathematical Oncology which brings together a group of applied mathematicians to collaborate with tumor biologists and clinical oncologists. And the goal of that is to develop nonlinear dynamic systems to examine the physiology of tumors, incorporating factors such as phenotypic evolution, intracellular communication pathways, and interaction of the microenvironmental factors, including therapies. As prostate cancer patients, we are particularly fortunate to have Bob join us because his adaptive therapy has been applied in prostate cancer, specifically uh, on a study including the dosing strategy for abiraterone, a novel hormone therapy, which I happen to be on currently. And I know some of the other patients that are on here have been on that uh, drug as well. So to summarize, Bob is really a, just a breath of fresh air. We're so fortunate to have him here. He has very novel ideas around cancer treatment that challenge conven conventional practice, particularly around the notion of maximum tolerable dose. And so uh, I wanna welcome uh, Bob and just a, a quick word on, on housekeeping. Uh, the way that we're gonna run this is it's gonna be interactive. If you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can also uh, ask the question in the chat and we'll try, to, uh, we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. Bob is gonna do a, a presentation. Uh, we would like to try to get through all of that. So we'll do a little bit of moderating as we go. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. Thank you. Uh, let me just share my screen here. Um, and apologies for this kind of formal presentation, but as I said earlier, this is kind of what I do. So uh, it, it's just kind of the, my, my usual thing. So um, so we're just I, I, the IMO, this is something I wanna mention is that uh, I think uniquely in cancer centers, we have a, a department of mathematics. Uh, we now have nine applied mathematicians and two evolutionary biologists. And the goal here is to, to do uh, like a physics related kind of paradigm where we have theoreticians and experimenters working together. Um, in complex dynamic systems like cancer, um, the physicists have taught us for centuries that this is really the, the only way you could kind of address these kinds of problems. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, so the two topics, I'm just gonna talk about uh, an evolution-based game theoretic uh, approach to treating uh, uh, cancers, uh, metastatic cancers for control or cure. Uh, an incidental theme here is, is my concerns about limitations in the clinical investigation gold standards of double blind kind of randomized trials, which I think have their have you know some benefits, but also have some drawbacks. And I think we're seeing those drawbacks now as, as we come into this uh, era in, in which we're moving away from maximum tolerated dose um, treatments. Um, so currently personalized um, cancer care. It's really all about molecular targets. So this is a great example of a, a woman with metastatic lung cancer. She has EGFR mutation, it's identified. Uh, there's targeted therapies for that, you give it, and she gets a great response. Um, you know, beautiful example of this. The problem is if you keep giving it, almost inevitably, the tumor will come back. It will evolve resistance and return, uh, leading to treatment failure, ultimately to the, to the death of the patient. Um, the, the, the basic idea here is that uh, this evolution of resistance is also patient-specific, drug-specific, and tumor-specific, and I think should also be part of this personalized medicine um, 
uh, initiative that, that's kind of going around uh, you know, the world. Um, the general principle here is that by applying uh, cytotoxic drugs, that, that, the, uh, that the selection for resistance is inevitable. The, 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 the cancer cells will, will access uh, the human genome and will find ways to get around it. But, but it's the proliferation of that population that you, a small population of resistant cells is meaningless. Uh, it becomes meaningful only when it proliferates sufficiently to become a clinically evident cancer. Now, one, one cc of tumor usually is about a billion cancer cells. So this requires a considerable amount of proliferation, and those are uh, dynamic subject to Dorian forces, and, and, and that's where we really want to, um, to try to focus. So uh, one of the approaches that you can do is, to, is, to, is a game theoretic model, and that is um, treat, uh, cancer treatment as a game. The oncologist is playing against the tumor. Uh, the oncologist plays the game by applying a therapy, and the tumor plays the game by applying an adaptive strategy. Um, when you look at this as a game theoretic, um, the oncologist actually has two enormous advantages. One is that he or she plays first. Um, in other words, the, the cancer cannot begin to evolve a resistance until the oncologist has placed a therapy now. Um, and this is called the Stackelberg game, and it's the equivalent of playing white pieces in chess. So the, the, the oncologist always leads the game. The second and probably more important one is that the oncologist is sentient. And can play dynamically. Um, that you can anticipate the future, can change therapies on the fly, um, depending on the evolutionary dynamics that are going on in the in the tumor. Cancers, any evolving population, can never anticipate the future. It can never adapt to to a, um, a, a an environment that it's not seen before. Um, and um, so, but the problem is that the, the dogma in cancer for the last 50 years has been that treatment uh, is applied continuously at maximum tolerated dose until progression. That's, that's uh, kind of the standard approach. But in doing that, you'll notice that the oncologist loses both advantages um, because the oncologist simply plays the same move over and over again, applies the same therapy again and again. Um, the, the cancer cells, do not have to change their adaptive strategies. They can just keep adapting to that. The other thing is that because the therapy is changed only when the cancer is observed to be to grow, um, the, it, you're ceding control of the game to the cancer. The cancer is leading the game, the oncologist is following. Um, and so part of what we're trying to do here is to, is to use these uh, advantages in a, in a dynamic way by understanding the underlying evolution. So if we, if we just kind of restate that game um, in an evolutionary point of view, you know, let's start with a mixed population of cells that most of them are sensitive, but a few are resistant. Uh, you can give maximum tolerated dose. You get a great response. The tumor sort of shrinks away. But what you leave behind almost inevitably is a small population of cells that are resistant. Now, you can keep treating, give the same treatment over and over again, but you're treating resistant cells, that you're having no effect. So even though the tumor may be not visible, you may not be seeing this growth because it's, it's below the resolution, it is in fact growing. Um, and this, this sort of conviction that oncologists have that the, that the tumor is under control with this therapy is really an illusion. And so eventually um, you, uh, you, you get proliferation sufficient that you can see it uh, with tumor progression. Now, this is a, this is a very well-known evolution dynamic, it's, it's called competitive release, it even has a name. Um, what's happening is that by using this approach, you're maximally killing off the, the cells that are sensitive, leaving behind the cells that are resistant and eliminating all their potential competitors. So to them, now they're only competing against each other. And, and that's bad for the patient because that means that these guys are, are slowly going, uh, getting better and better at what they do. An alternative approach, and this is just one of many, but th this is what's called adaptive therapy, um, is to deliberately uh, pull your punches. Um, you can apply treatment, but you, you, you specifically want to keep, keep intact a sufficient population 
of sensitive cells. So you, you really treat only enough to, to, to sort of knock the tumor back a little bit. Um, and then you stop treatment, uh, you pull it away and the, uh, the tumor will regrow. Um, but since you're not applying a selection for resistance and because in general, the sensitive cells, which do not have the burden of the resistance mechanisms uh, that, that, that the resistant cells have, um, they have a fitness advantage. And so when the tumor grows back, you essentially recapitulate the, uh, the, the initial population, meaning that you still have a large number of sensitive cells and you simply treat again, you just keep, so, so this adaptive therapy is simply cycling um, you know, the minimum necessary uh, um, therapies to keep the cells in check. And so the goal here is to, is to use the sensitive cells um, that you can control to control the resistant cells that you cannot control. Um, and so, so this is kind of the, the basic idea. Um, there is a, a the, mathematically, this is the idea here is to use the, the, the cycle. I cannot hear. Use the cycling of the sensitive cells as a forcing function. Uh, okay, this is not a passive approach. You're, you're driving them, you know, forward and backwards. And the idea is to use that oscillating, uh, those oscillating dynamics to create a near steady state. Um, the first attempt to look at this, that, that we did preclinical experiments, but then uh, the first uh, group uh, that we looked at for this was abiraterone therapy in, in men with uh, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. Um, the, uh, the, the way this works is that uh, most of the cells in a typical prostate cancer at the beginning re require uh, exogenous uh, androgen produced by the body. Um, when you start to knock those down with the initial therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, some of the tumor cells begin to make their own uh, testosterone. Um, and that then, um, and so they can proliferate uh, and become resistant. Um, Abiraterone blocks that, that enzyme so that they are no longer making testosterone. Um, these are, so this is typically a second line therapy. Uh, time to radiographic progression typically is in the range of eight to 16 months, depending on pretreatment. Um, so we established basically a mathematical model for this. And, uh, and, and this is, the, the details are not necessarily uh, important, uh, but just to, just to give you some idea, uh, although, you, although there's, you could look at this in a variety of ways. Here we just used a very simple model. We have, we have a population of cells, either the T plus cells that require uh, exogenous testosterone, TP cells, these are the cells that make testosterone and these are the ones sensitive to abiraterone and the T minus cells that proliferate independent of testosterone. Those are the bad guys. Those are the ones we want to suppress. Uh, we have a mathematical model. There's an interesting uh, dynamic here because the TP cells not only make testosterone, they spill it into the environment. And so the T plus cells can actually use that. And, and that's, that's called cheating. Um, and they have the testosterone is a common good. Uh, so that kind of can complicate some of these dynamics. Uh, we have uh, two mathematicians and an evolutionary biologist here as part of the group working on this. Uh, we develop a payoff matrix. Um, Jin Song Zhang is the very brave oncologist who uh, brought this into the into clinical practice, and it was a very simple um, uh, a protocol. We just basically said that um, you would, would you give abiraterone if the patient responds. When the PSA gets to fifty percent of the pretreatment value, you stop, um, and then you uh, let the tumor go. And when uh, the PSA comes back to what it was pretreatment, you start again. So you just cycle this over and over again. Um, our mathematical models predicted that we could control the tumor for two to 20 cycles. And this actually turned out to be incorrect. And I'll, I'll talk about why it was incorrect in a, in a few minutes. So we basically uh, completed the trial. Was, this was done. There's no funding for this at all. We, we, we just scraped money together to do this. Um, we had um, 17 patients uh, that were completed the trial. We compared those to 16 patients who had the same 50% PSA decline with the initial abiraterone dose, but who then got standard of care dosing. Uh, these were quite, this 
the, the, these groups were quite similar demographically. Um, this is the result of the um, of where we are now with this. Uh, this the uh, I guess that I'm colorblind. But I think this is red. Um, is the adaptive therapy group the blue or whatever color that is is the standard group. Um, the difference in median time to progression was uh, 14.3 compared to 33.5. Uh, this is the different cohorts. And what's interesting is that four of these patients are still alive and still on treatment uh, uh, over six years uh, since, uh, since the treatment began. Um, overall survival uh, in the standard of care was 30.4, it was 58.5 months in the adaptive therapy group. Um, the, because of this cycle, and people, the patients on the uh, trial did not get treatment from, like, from abiraterone about 46% of their time on trials, about half, half the time they were under treatment, about half the time they were not. Um, some economists came in and uh, examined this and they found a cost reduction of 70, 000, average $70,000 per patient per year largely because of drug costs. Um, and as I mentioned, we have four patients that, that are still um, stably on cycle, still going strong. Uh, uh, now they're, they're more than six years out. And this was not predicted by the model simulations. And, 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 and this becomes an important part, I think, of the whole analysis. So uh, these are just details. We, because we use the mathematical model to guide the trial, we can use the mathematical model to analyze the trial. And so what we did was first use the longitudinal data from the trial to update our parameter estimates to see if we were correct. And, and this is how we did it. I, I won't go into the details of it. Um, one of the things that we could do then is through the models, predict what the pretreatment fraction of resistant cells was. And when we look at that, we can see that the predicted fraction, uh, the higher it was, the, uh, the, the shorter the, the, the time to progression was, which, which, which makes sense. But you can also see that the circles are the standard of care, that the triangles are the um, patients that were uh, on adaptive therapy, that every, at every fraction of, 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 uh, popula of, of resistant cells uh, the adaptive therapy group did better than the standard of care. And this is just an example of this. This is two patients that had roughly the same fraction of resistant cells estimated by the models. And you can see that um, this person started treatment here and, and uh, progressed after 220 days. This person went through multiple cycles before progressing at, at 1,400 days. So this is kind of an example of how this was different um, between the two. The, um, the, this turned out to be an error that we made. Um, the, a critical, so if, if you're using the sensitive cells and their fitness advantage to suppress the proliferation of the resistant cells, the critical factor is the difference in their relative fitness in the absence of treatment. Um, the greater that difference is, uh, the greater the suppression of the resistant cells by the sensitive cells. Um, our pretreatment um, estimate was that this would be two. What we found in looking at the data, though, is that the number is closer to seven, um, about a threefold increase. So now I'm, I'm going to go all nerd on you here for a minute because this turns out to have clinical consequences. And, and I can show that here. If you look mostly at, this, at the lower left um, uh, corner, this is assuming a, a ratio of three. So closer to what we assumed originally. And, and this is what we thought would happen. So whenever you see a um, decline, you, you treat the tumor, you see a decline in the sensitive population. When that happens, you'll see an increase in the resistant population. When you then stop therapy and let the, the sensitive cells go back, what we predict is that this would plateau. So it, it, you would suppress it 
so that it stayed stable. So what we thought would happen with each cycle was that we, it would go up, plateau, up, plateau, up, plateau. And because of that steady increase, that was why we had an absolute um, uh, uh, ceiling on how many cycles he could go, no more than 20, according to the model. Here's the difference. If you have a, this, if this ratio is, is higher, then the fitness benefit of the, of the sensitive cells is greater than expected. And so instead of this up and, 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 and plateau is that whenever the sensitive cells would go up, the resistant cells would go down. Um, and what we found was that if we could hit this right, if, if we stuck to the protocol exactly, we would actually reduce the resistant population somewhere near extinction, you know, somewhere near zero. Um, so do we see that? And so in the, so we went back and looked at the um, four patients that were still cycling. And what we found, and again, just look at this, this bottom line, what we found was that they, that the math, so what, what we can do, and you know, just to explain this, now that we have an updated model, we can apply it to every patient on the trial. And we can see the model can tell us what happened leading to the outcome that's observed. Um, so so the, the, instead of just looking at, at cohorts, which is kind of the standard way clinical trials are run, you know, statistical differences between A and B, what we want to understand is why A was better than B. What, what, what was it that, that, that uh, was successful? And I think more importantly, um, how could we have done it better? You know, what, where did we, what did we do right, but what did we do wrong? In this case, um, what the math models show is that this patient who's still being treated, um, in the very beginning, we hit these, these cycles perfectly, um, knocked the population down to something close to zero. And what's interesting in, is in these cycles, which are not as perfect as these guys, you know, the, these, are, these are not optimal really because we, we didn't, go up, didn't go up as high as we should have. Um, we didn't get a blip, nothing happened, um, suggesting that this population of resistant cells is really very small and possibly zero. So I should point out that the, we actually have looked now at circulating DNA for in these four patients have not been able to detect any markers of resistance. Um, so why do we fail? Again, this is the, the to me, this is uh, as important as understanding what we, what we did right. And why did 13 of the 17 patients that we treated with the therapy progress? And it turned out we made an error. Um, what we did was, um, it, what, we, what, the, what the protocol said was that it, at 50% drop of the PSA from pre-treatment value, you stop therapy. The protocol, however, was written so that that had to be confirmed by radiographic study. We could get PSA every month, but we could only get radiographic studies every three or four months. And so what would happen is that instead of this ideal cycle that we wanted, the PSA would go to zero in this patient and stay there for a prolonged period of time, months, before it was allowed to come back up. And we kept, and, and, and you can see that we fell below this ideal cycle. And so what we're, what we're doing is overtreating the patient. You know, instead of allowing a, the, a, a substantial population of sensitive cells to remain, we are eliminating them. And what, what you can see here then is that by, by making this population very small, um, the resistant population kept going up. We, we almost got back control, but then, then lost it. And so what, the, what this is telling us is that, um, and, and, and again, we, so we can now take these patients and say, what, what, what if we had done it? exactly right. What if we had hit this perfectly? Um, what it showed was that um, every patient in both protocols, had we done it correctly, we could have had very long-term control of, of, the, of the tumor. So, so we've learned a lot. And so the, the point of this is that by using the models, we can now say, how do we design our next protocol? And, and how do we, what, what kind of, what are we going to learn from this and how can we do it better? Okay, so this is this is part one. Um, so I, I, you know, I think that um, 
it, it, the, the lesson here is that um, the current approach to uh, evolution of resistance is quite fatalistic among oncologists. Um, and what, what we think is that it, that it can be changed. We can, we can, we can uh, interfere in these evolution dynamics and do things that will at least slow it down, if not totally stop it. Um, I think that the value of these, of these, of the classic, you know, uh, randomized double blind uh, trials is inversely uh, proportional to the, to the, our understanding. Um, if you treat intertumoral evolution dynamics as a black box, and if you, and if you just don't try to investigate it, just always, it's always going to be, be unknown. And so, so I think that the problem is that you get these results from these trials and you don't know what to do. You know, and so what we keep doing is adding new drugs to the mix without really understanding the dynamics that led to the results in the first place. Um, so I think that you can, I would suggest that by integrating these evolution-based mathematical models of trial design, you can get more information from smaller trials. Uh, you can critique your trial and, and so go to an improved trial uh, in follow-up studies. Okay, so I'm going to now, if, if you if you will bear with me for a minute, descend into pure speculation. Um, and so, um, you know, everybody that, that has you know is associated with cancer treatment has probably had this experience, where at a family gathering or at some kind of party, you get uh, cornered by an acquaintance or a relative saying, you know, why isn't it true that you guys know the cure from can for cancer? Uh, and, but it's not being used because you want to make more money. Um, and, and of course, this is one of the conspiracy theories that's been out for, for decades. And, um, and it, it, conspiracy theory aside, you know, I, it, 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 what's interesting to me is that this concept of the cure for cancer, it's, it's, it's a thing, the cure for cancer. Um, and, you know, I think that that really comes from this the, the, the work of Ehrlich, who, um, who, who popularized this concept of magic bullets, the, uh, this idea that you could identify an agent that was selectively toxic to cancer cells, uh, but left normal cells alone. And, um, you know, the, the antibiotic era kind of made it look like that should be possible um, in, um, in, in cancer. But, but, and I, so I'd argue that that, that all of drug development is in some ways related to this idea of, of finding a magic bullet. And um, personally, I thought that this, that this was not possible. You know, the, the idea of a magic bullet seems highly uh, improbable to me because of the size and the phenotypic diversity and spatial di dispersion of cancers. And to, those to me seem like insurmountable burdens. Um, but I, um, was persuaded otherwise, to, well, at least that, that we should be looking at, at, at other things by um, primarily Damon Reed, who is a, a pediatric oncologist who treats um, teenagers with metastatic rhabdomyosarcoma and other sarcomas. Um, in, in, medicine, in the metastatic setting, these kids usually die. Um, so we talked about adaptive therapy. I think it would, they would actually be very good candidates for adaptive therapy because they typically respond very well to initial therapy. But in talking to other pediatric oncologists, they said that's nice, but not good enough. Um, you know, we're about curing things. You got to go back and find a cure. Um, and so this is kind of the group of people that have been involved in this uh, multidisciplinary um, idea. So, um, so going back to the drawing board, you know, let's start with the idea that cancer cure is like an extinction. Um, it's an extinction of a large, diverse, spatially dispersed and asexually reproducing clade. Whenever we think about extinction, we always go to the dinosaurs. Um, you know, this idea uh, in the popular imagination is that extinction requires this, this impact, this, the, you know, the, the KT impact application of massive evolutionary force that essentially wipes out the, um, this, this population as a single cause, single event. Um, the problem with that approach, and arguably that's, that's kind of what we try to do with the maximum power rate of the dose, you know, continuously, um, is that it's indiscriminate. Uh, the KT impact also destroyed 60% of the other land animal species. And so, you know, brute force 
uh, uh, as an extinction strategy is always limited by this indiscriminate effects. And in the case of, of, of cancer, you're always going to be limited by the effects on normal cells. Um, so is that, is that the only way we can make extinctions? Um, well, it turns out that um, we live in the, what's called the Anthropocene era, meaning that uh, our species is killing off other species. Um, and um, th 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 that's terrible, of course, but the silver lining is that these have actually been very well uh, studied. And so there is new data that's being generated about extinction and the dynamics of, extinct of extinction. And so, um, you know, examples are the passenger pigeon, which is uh, the most populous bird on earth at the time, probably 4 billion uh, birds in, in, in the population. The humans eradicated it within um, 100 years. <laughs> Another one is an intentional uh, Anthropocene extinction, and that's the Galapagos goat. And I want I just want to talk about that for a second. So the, these goats were introduced by sailors um, into the Galapagos Islands. They, were, they probably were left there as potential food sources whenever they returned. And over the years, this population grew until in the 1980s and 90s, uh, there were about 500,000 goats uh, in, in, on the islands. And they were uh, both destroying the native um, uh, species, the, the native plants, and crowding out some of the native animal species. And an international consortium decided that it was time to kill off the Galapagos goat. And so this is a, a, an intentional Anthropocene extinction. Well, how did they do it? Um, basically, they put, uh, they got uh, uh, New Zealand sharpshooters, gave them automatic weapons, put them in helicopters or on trucks, and they drove around or flew around the Galapagos Islands, came across a herd of goats and just gunned them down. Um, and, and this was just mass slaughter. Um, the population, you know, plummeted. But it did not go away. And the reason is that some of the goats became sensitive to the sound of helicopters and trucks. And as soon as they uh, heard them, they would run into the woods where they would hide. Um, and they could not be found. This population not only um, survived, but actually began to proliferate somewhat. And so uh, they had to come up with something else. And, and the strategy that they came up with is called the Judas goat. Um, they, um, this is a female goat that was neutered. Uh, they put a radio collar on her, spread hormones all over her, sent her out. She ended up joining these, these small herds and they could track them down through the radio collar and kill them. Um, in the end, that eradicated the, the population. Now, look at the dynamics of this extinction. And, and this is often now divided conceptually into a first strike and a second strike. The first strike involved a, a reduction, a massive reduction in the population, but it also selected for certain resistance populations. Um, and, and you could keep applying the first strike all you want. This, the, the, this group was, was, uh, was resistant and you were get, going to get no further advantage. The second strike required a different strategy than the first strike. It required a strategy that would never have been effective in, as a first strike, um, because this is really very targeted and small. Um, but the point here is that uh, anthropocene extinction are, are not a single cause, single event, you know, dinosaur uh, eradication. It's a multi-cause, multi-event process. And you'll notice that neither, that, that none of the treatments that are applied here by itself could cause extinction. It's the, it's the uh, strategic um, uh, sequence of these. Um, and so can we think about this in terms of cure? So, and, and this is just an example of, uh, this is a breast cancer pre and post neoadjuvant therapy. So this is the biopsy before treatment on the left, on the right is the surgical specimen. And you'll notice that this is, we, we start with this large continuous population and you'll see that what's left behind, the survivors are just these small islands of tumor cells. You know, again, very, very analogous to the, um, 
to the to the Galapagos goat. Um, so when we think about um, what we can, how can we deal with these small populations? Um, what we know is that large populations and small populations of the same species are entirely different. They respond differently to perturbations. Um, the reason is that small populations are sensitive to, to stochastic events, uh, small changes in uh, birth rate or death rate can have, can, can cause a population to go extinct, um, whereas that would never happen with a large population. And re remember now that the extinction here is an absorbing boundary. You know, once the, once this population, you know, goes to, to some threshold, uh, it's gone and it cannot come back. Um, the other thing is the Lee effects that, that large populations typically have a fitness advantage over small populations for a number of reasons. And Lee effects have been um, well recognized in, in cancers. And, but the combination, what, 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 what's seen in these small populations is now characterized by the evolutionary biologist as the extinction vortex. And what that means is that every time you knock the population down a little bit, it becomes more um, vulnerable to extinction because the smaller the population is, the more these stochastic events and, and LE effects have an, have an effect. And so this idea is that, well, although we talked about a second strike in the case of the Galapagos Islands, that here a second strike is really a, a series of small perturbations being applied to the small population with the goal of continuously sending it down this extinction vortex. And these are these become self-reinforcing um, and, 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 and therefore can be used strategically to essentially eliminate the population. So we've modeled this and you can see that on the, on the top row here is, is a typical U-shaped uh, response. You, you give treatment, uh, get a great response, stays stable for a while, comes back up. Now suppose you, and, and we do now say, let's, let's add another treatment to that. So now we do two treatments. How do we do it typically? We add them in front. They, they are given at the beginning. The problem with that is that you're applying the second therapy to the largest possible population. And so the heterogeneity is such that, that almost certainly you will, you, the, that there will, you will find tumor cells that can uh, be resistant to both. So the model shows, yes, that works very well in the sense that the, uh, the response is more prolonged, but as is typically observed in cancer populations, it eventually comes back. You have three, four, five drugs, you see the same kind of, uh, of result typically. Um, and um, I, it, eventually you get to a point where you're not getting any better results and you're just increasing toxicity. But now take the same drug and instead of giving it at the beginning, give it when, you, when you've got the tumor on the ropes, the, the tumor, the, the population isn't decline. It is, it is badly damaged by initial therapy. These guys are now vulnerable to extinction. And when you give it during this period of decline and toward it, the, the, uh, the, the lowest level of the population, what you can see is that here, that second perturbation can cause extinction. Um, not always, I mean, and, and, and it's, it's, it's obviously more complicated than that. But again, the idea is that we need to be thinking about giving cancer therapy uh, in ways that are strategic and are, um, uh, are exploiting the vulnerability of small populations to extinction. Um, so there, there, this has been a couple of papers that we've published on this. Um, the pediatric oncologist, by the way, uh, embraced this almost immediately because they know it. This is um, basically the strategy that's been empirically derived to cure kids with leukemia. Um, they start with an induction therapy. What they've learned historically is that although at the end of induction therapy, you can find no, you can frequently not find cancer cells in the blood or in the bone marrow, but historically they know it always comes back. And so rather than waiting for the tumor to come back, which is what adult oncologists typically do, they begin treating immediately. So they, they after uh, the induction treatment, they then do consolidation. They, this is the second strike now. They're, now they're applying a sequence of different drugs um, uh, subsequently and, and this is what, this is a, you know, a curative, a, a curative outcome is common now. So um, lacking magic bullets, um, and maybe we'll get magic bullets. Uh, that would be very nice if we could. Um, 
I think that, that metastatic cancers can be cured potentially through a strategic combination of not magic bullets, but pretty good bullets. Um, you know, none of these bullets could, could by themselves cure the cancer, but the combination could. And so if we, um, the, 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 the kind of um, point here is that um, we need to hit cancers when they're down. We, my, one of my colleagues likes to say, we, we, we use the boxing rules now. So you, you, you get a, um, a, you knock a tumor down and what do you do? You just stand back and wait for it to come back. Um, and, and so this is what we do. This is, um, this is prostate cancer therapy. You, you start with androgen deprivation therapy here, you get this kind of U-shaped response. Um, you can get, uh, you can normalize PSA in the vast majority of patients and, and uh, frequently it's not, it becomes undetectable, but you know, historically it comes back. Uh, when do we start therapy again? Well, we, 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 we wait for it to come back. You know, it gets up off the mat, shakes its head, you know, and is ready to go. Um, and what we said is, this is a knife fight. Uh, when you when you got your patient on the mat, when you got your opponent on the mat, you, you close and kill them. Um, and so where you give the therapy that's curative, it's here, when the PSA goes down, uh, when the sentence in a deer. Um, and this is where we think you should basically pull out the stops and hit it with everything you've got. And so with that, I will just put in a plug. The, uh, this is the Moffitt Evolutionary Tumor Board. I think it's unique. Um, we have, uh, it's run by oncologists, but it includes uh, mathematicians, evolutionary biologists, and a wide range of, of people. And, um, and also thank the funding. With that, I'll stop and be happy to answer questions or comments. Great, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, thanks, Bob. That was a phenomenal presentation and an overview of the work that you're doing. See some uh, hands clapping there from, uh, from Rick. Uh, we do have <laughs> yeah, it's every time I read about what you're doing or I listen to you on a podcast or now, you know, uh, hear you with the group, it is, um, it's so inspiring. Um, I have a question um, that I have at the end. Um, we've got about 15 minutes. I would love for others to ask their questions. There are some in the chat. Brad, I think you're monitoring chat. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I want to cue Saeed. Um, uh, Bob, like you, he's a fellow um, mathematician with simulation models and um, MD as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think he's probably been listening and agreeing with you uh, quite a bit. Um, Saeed, did you have any questions or comments? Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a great uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, everything, uh, I mentioned this one before, uh, the every simulation we have done using omics data on the uh, psoriasis or uh, cancer data, many diseases, all of them supports the less concentration and combination therapy. And uh, single therapy and increasing the concentration just increases the reaction from other uh, genes or systems in. in uh, and uh, then, yeah, I support it. I'm not sure about the sequence of the treatment. Should it be at one time or it should be in sequence? This is a different story. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just want to say I completely support this, this hypothesis, which is really now is in, it's been proven by some of uh, what Robert mentioned. The one question I have here is about the biological system. They are highly parallel, massively parallel system. And uh, how do you deal with this issue using a simple mathematical equation? Um, well, we, we, we started simple and we, we, and we go up. Um, you know, the, the, the old adage that um, uh, the mo a model should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. Um, so uh, we started the prostate trial, for example, using three populations because we know they were they 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 made sense biologically. We felt certain that there were other populations present, you know, subpopulations and 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 certainly more complex dynamics. The question was was that sufficient to at least make some predictive models? Um, 
And so I think what we'll find is that as time goes on, you know, our models are going to have to change. Um, and uh, but but my my thinking is that it, it it should be like it should be in lockstep, similar to the way we've learned how to to um, to, to predict weather. You know, we need to first of all we, we need to get models. The models have to be sufficiently complex, and then and for the weather they have to be really quite complex. But we also have to then get data to to, to parameterize the models. You can't just get any data. So I think what my own kind of impression of cancer therapy right now is that we just keep gathering data without any clear idea of, of, how, of what the fundamental principles are and how these data you know, are, can be used to parameterize models. So I think it's, so this idea that the models can help you uh, understand what data are most important to get <coughs> models. The models you know, can be, uh, can, can work some, so they're clearly not, not gonna work and all models are wrong to some extent. And so we then have to build the model into you know, complexity as needed to get the, the outcome that we want. Um, but given, given the very simple starting point, that's kind of where we started. So. Yeah, for sure it's a strong start, but the point here is it's some sort of general model, right? There is no uh, other uh, variable in it. Uh, that's the phenotype, genotype, all those. But that's a great idea. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I think it's uh, and, and you know it's a very good point that we um, the, the, the this we and by no means you know say this is the way to, to go with this. It's simply the starting point for it. Um, Certainly. And uh, and I think it'll be fascinating to see this happen. But uh, you know it's hard to get mathematicians and oncologists and biologists to talk with each other. It's not traditionally done. Um, and that's why, so uh, when they recruited me to head their radiology department here, um, and I had them over a barrel pretty much, I said that's what I wanted because I really felt that um, unless you get people co in the same spot, mathematicians and experimentalists working together, uh, that, that you, it's really hard to overcome all of the barriers. Um, and so we've, the, this program has been going on for 15 years. So it's, it's a while and it took some time to, to overcome these barriers and we still are overcoming them. But I mean, clearly we have uh, much more uh, interactions than, than we ever did before. I'd like Thank to you. bring, I'd like to bring the conversation from theory into practice and take a moment before we go to ask uh, Brian and Rick to interact with you, Bob, on their specific cases and the specific decisions they're, they're facing right now to see what your theory would apply in practice in their cases. And Mike Yancey had a question too, so we could ask you know, him, but I, I think Brian and Rick should go next. Sure, Rick, you wanna, you wanna fire? No, I, no you, you go first because you're on Abiraterone. <laughs> okay, all right, <laughs> all right. So let's see here if I can share this. Okay. Um, this, uh, Bob, I know that uh, hopefully you've seen this. I, I think I shared this with you earlier. Um, I'm not going to take you through the whole thing. Hopefully you've seen, you know, seen it. The, the Reader's Digest is that, you know, I've been battling this for six years. I've had, you know, surgery, uh, was on, you know, radiation and Lupron. You, you can see I, I did um, do a, a combo of a uh, Lupron and apalutamide, um, very effective. Um, did not use adaptive therapy. Um, I, I beat it to death. Um, and then I decided to take a, a complete holiday from everything. Uh, this is a uh, point number five here. Um, as soon as I did that, saw my PSA jump up significantly. Um, I went from no evidence of disease to six lesions in my peritoneum mm -hmm. in August of 2020, had surgery, um, didn't get it all, just because of margins, et cetera. Um, then I started a, a combination of chemo plus Pembro, which was probably questionable. The chemo is probably fine, but in any event, um, I did see a decline uh, in my PSA from about 1.2 um, all the way down here to about 0.23 or so. Um, and then uh, I saw it begin to rise uh, and uh, three, I had th three lesions um, just uh, uh, you know, uh, in 2020. I've been on abiraterone 
uh, since November of 2021. Sorry, that should be 20, uh, 2021. Um, I've been on Abiraterone since uh, 2021, or, uh, November of 2021. I have seen a decline. So if I look at your model, my I started at 0.91. Uh, got all the way down to about 0.45. Now I just jumped a little bit to 0.49. You know, I, first off, is it too late to even consider using adaptive therapy? Um, could, could I, you know, um, you know, work with you and my oncologist to enable that? Um, and if not, there's going to be another therapy for me around the corner. It could be one or it could be um, several. You know, it could be a combination Um how would we attack that uh, problem? Can I ask you, you know, are, are you on Lucron 2 or just at Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, looking at the graph, I would say uh, I, I don't, I would not take Abrad on the way right now because the, the problem is that if you, if, you, if, you, if you kill off too many of the resistant cell, uh, the sensitive cells, you don't, and, and, and try to do this, it, it, it will not be as effective or, or effective at all. And so the fact that you plateaued um, makes me think that's probably not gonna be an effective approach. On the other hand, you have very low volume disease. Um, and and um, you know, I, I think, I mean, we probably have time. So, for example, this is where uh, the lutetium PSMA might be a uh, a treatment option with again having low low volume disease. Um, the uh, the um, I I would be interested to know, and, and this is where this is where I, I you know the geo oncologist is 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 you know, really critical. Um, what does he or she think would be uh, the, the, you know, could you, for example, go back to um, uh, apalutamide or uh, some of the others, you know, um, the- uh, um, Derolutamide or, yeah, I don't think there's any benefit really to cross over to enzalutamide once I'm on abiraterone. Yeah. Um, we have- um, yeah. The, the you can what's the, uh, the the new therapy for that blocks the androgen receptor? Um, I, I uh, darolutamide, the mm -hmm. the bear drug. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't you know I don't remember. But um, so the, the question in it, first of all in in this sort of mix of hormone related therapies, what are the options to continue therapy right now? And and this is. It's, it, you've got such a mix that, um, you know, in the past that, that I would really first ask, the, you know, the oncologist to take their best shot at what you think, what they think would be the best approach. Uh, um, I would think about PSMA uh, lutetium as, as, as an addition. I mean, give, given the small volume, I, I, you know, I think you could try extinction treatments, you know, a sequence of hits that would be um, with the goal of just keep pushing it down, you know, this, this, this extinction ladder. Now, um, just as a, a side, one of the problems is that we don't know uh, whether uh, tre treatments currently are, um, are uh, approved based on their, their monotherapy effects in, in the cancer. Um, but these are big cancers. These may not have, they, they may be entirely different. They may be far more effective in, um, in small tumors. So anti-angiogenic therapies, which are traditionally not given in um, prostate cancer, may in fact be highly effective uh, with small tumor populations. And if you, if you think about the, those islands of cells that I showed you, um, those guys are probably at the very edge of, uh, of their um, metabolic existence. And, and, you know, in that setting, uh, the antigenic effects may be very useful. The, um, you know, some of the uh, 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 immunotherapies, you know, I think also 
uh, you know, again, in this setting of small tumor volume uh, would, would be very effective. And some chemotherapies that are, again, not typically given, um, but, but could in this setting be highly effective. You know, again, you have to just nudge it down the vortex. You don't, you don't, you don't have to get home runs with each of them. You just have to get bunt singles. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's how, now I, I would, the, the way this usually works is that um, I, you know, I work with the oncologist who yeah. provides the expertise in terms of drugs, the most likely um, treatments and so forth. Um, we do, I, one of our, one of our extinction patients uh, is a scientist uh, at the Huntsman Institute, who is also uh, extensively investigated uh, kind of non-traditional medical things like the role of exercise and the role of some, some dietary things. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I also tend to like to get him involved in that because I think some of these, he, he's, he has reasonable evidence that some of these things are, are, are um, you know, good effect. So, um, the uh, so that that would be my approach. I, I would I would I would say the way we typically do this is that um, in patients who are not Moffitt patients, we we have an oncologist, uh, an evolutionary biologist, a mathematician, and, and me. And, and the oncologist would typically be your oncologist, and we meet and with you present uh, and talk about the options because we what we try to t tell the oncologist is that. You know, you you are a modeler. You, you you have models in your head about what's going on. Our goal here uh, is is to take those models and and frame them mathematically, and then analyze them mathematically. So so that we're not trying to displace you. We're simply trying to uh, allow your model to be uh, simulated. And so we we can do thousands of simulations, and and that's typically um, how this like at, at Moffitt. The way things are done is that we. We meet with the oncologist. Um, we uh, we do the model and and we and run thousands of simulations. And then about ten days later, the full tumor board meets and the computer simulations are then presented to the board. And it's part of their deliberations. It's not a you know they don't follow those. They they obviously there's this uh, you know clinical intuition. There's 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 all, all sorts of uh, you know clinical uh, uh, um, you know issues that have to be dealt with. Some, some things are just not practical. Uh, and out of that comes a decision. And the decision is basically made by the oncologist and the patient. Um, so, uh, but, but we try to, so our goal here is to be informative uh, and to do the best we can to simulate what we think will happen given various uh, treatment options and what we think is the best thing, again, and, and ultimately decided by the patient and the oncologist. Um, with all other factors involved. And so, for example, sometimes we, we think, you, you know, you, this is the therapy you should try, but the insurance companies won't pay for it. So, right. in the setting, you know, then we have to um, uh, make some kind of compromise. And, and so, so everything has been about that. So, for example, when we, when, when we started our trial, um, we wanted them to get the PSA every two weeks. Um, and so, with all apologies, to people with Y chromosomes here, what I learned is that men are terrible patients and absolutely would not get, you know, every four weeks, um, you know, PSA. Women will get it every week if you want it, but, but men will not. So those are the things I've Take learned. mine daily. <laughs> There's also other approaches. So there, uh, Michelle Lockley, who is an oncologist in um, the UK, has just started a, a trial in ovarian cancer um, using an approach that we developed actually in, in, in animal models, but, but did not feel we could get into the clinic. And, and that is an approach that where you, you actually try to keep the tumor stable in size and you continuously uh, adjust the dose of drug to, to keep it there. Um, now that's, in, in animal models, that was the best approach. That, that actually got the best results. And one of the interesting things about that is that um, over time, it turns out you need less and less drug to keep the tumor under control. And we, we observed that, they observed that in their preclinical experiment. And so they brought that into the clinic. Um, I think that on a practical level, it's very difficult, 
but but that could be done. I mean, I, they obviously they're doing it, and so something like that would be a, a, a also a, a you know a potentially good approach. And in fact, in our preclinical models, was the best approach. What, what we did with the with our abiraterone trial was kind of the next best approach because that fit into the practicality of uh, clinical medicine more than did the other one. So 